Hello and welcome to Where is Shakespeare Buried? My name is Glenn Alexander and thank you very much for being here with me today and clicking on this video. Um, before we start, I'll just forewarn you, this is unscripted as usual, so there will be some mums and ahs, but I hope it is the uh, ideas that are exciting and interesting uh, to you. So we're going to start with the uh, Shakespeare Monument in Westminster Abbey and the first thing I'll do is just say thank you to Alexander Waugh uh, who's a terrific researcher who has done some wonderful work to lead us up to this point and also to say thank you because he's the person who invited me into this debate and for his support and kindness so thank you very much Alexander. Now that being said I don't believe that the story finishes there um, and I would like to share with you what I believe. So the first thing I'm going to say is what is Shakespeare pointing to? Um, he is indicating something and if we have a look to the scroll and the inscription on the scroll uh, you can see that he's pointing to uh, temples and specifically the E in temples. Now it just so happens that the word temples itself in Sumerian uh, means E. So the word means E itself. Um, if we compare this to where it's from um, in Act 4, Scene 1 of The Tempest, um, you'll notice some differences. Westminster Abbey website calls it variants, but don't understand why it's, it's quite clear. It's telling you something if we have a look at the differences between it. Uh, if we have a look at the words uh, cloud, for instance, the U has been exchanged for a W or two Vs. Um, of our W. Uh, if we have a look at towers, you'll notice the E in towers has gone missing. It's disappeared. The E has disappeared. Uh, we have a double L in palaces, uh, double L in the uh, first folio version. We have this uh, R W, which is a uh, double V. Um, and we've exchanged these lines here. Um, we've changed uh, this insubstantial pageant faded, which should be here for the baseless fabric of this vision. So we've exchanged those two lines, uh, rack for wreck. And for me, crucially, it's the additional E's in the first folio, this three, that have gone missing. So you can see that some of the E's, four times here, um, the E's have gone missing and he's pointing to an E. And if I continued uh, with the uh, first folio version. Uh, you'd also see that there's some additional added E's on the ends of words like walk, mind, sleep as well. Um, if I was to further then draw a line through where he is pointing through uh, those two dots and I continue that line through you're going to see it goes all the way through to the E uh, of leave. Uh, also through the double L of shall and uh, the H there. Interesting. So just to remind you, he's pointing to an E. Temples itself, Sumerian means E. Uh, if we compare it to the first folio, you'll notice uh, there's some differences to do with E's. Um, and the line itself is going to an E on the other side. And if we look at the monument and the position of Mr Shakespeare in that monument, you may be able to see his arms themselves are in an E. So E, why is it so significant. Well, I like to call it um, the conceited E or the E of conceit. He'd probably call it a qualifying E. Uh, conceit means some cunning is afoot uh, and something to do with yourself. Um, so that's what the E is. Uh, just as in the first folio, you'll find E is added to things like book with an E on the end. Here's an important book. Uh, this is the Art of English Posy, and you may notice this added E on the end of art. In fact, it teaches you about what is going on here in book three, uh, the third of ornament, or it's a book all to do with the, uh, the third one about the figures of rhetoric. And what you think the first figure of rhetoric he teaches you in this book is? It is the figure of addition. This is a semantic figure, um, adding one letter to a word to change the meaning, uh, which is what you're seeing here. Now, you're going to meet the figure of addition 
um, a little bit later in this video. Uh, you've already met the figure of exchange uh, and you'll meet that shortly, I'm sure, as well. Uh, so what is Shakespeare looking at? As human beings, it's not just what we um, indicate with our hands and our gestures and what we're pointing to. Um, we also indicate uh, what we mean with our eyes, what we look at, where we're giving our attention to, uh, whether we are actively wanting something or trying to avoid something. We indicate it with our eyes. So what is Mr. Shakespeare looking at? So if we look through Shakespeare's eyes, you will see he is looking at this monument here. A very interesting monument. You'll notice the shape differs from those around. So does the colour. It's in red and white marble. Um, this monument um, is to uh, Edward and Robert Atkins. Let's just have a closer uh, look in a second, but let's just note kind of the commonalities and differences from what we've seen. Uh, above uh, we had uh, above Shakespeare's head, we had a tablet, there's his head there, and you can see the shape of it. Well, the bottom is similar, but the, uh, the top of it's a, a little bit different. Uh, if we have a look, let's have a look below um, on, on the sarcophagus at the inscription there. Uh, you'll see that something's being shouted to you in block capitals, and that is Edward is being shouted uh, in block capitals to you there. If we have a look above at the inscription above, well, similar thing. We have Edward um, and Robert uh, Atkins. If you're wondering why uh, the Robert Atkins, well, Think about the word Atkins. A and T are the first and last letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Kin means family, a little more than kin and less than kind, uh, says Hamlet. And it's something to do with his family, which I'm not going to go um, into in this video. Uh, Robert is certainly related. Uh, so if we go back to here, let's just do some anal further analysis, break it apart and have a look at its different constituent parts. So if we have a look uh, here, we have these curly um, horn-like things, curly horns. Um, you're going to meet these a few times, I'm sure, to come. Uh, we have a tie, a, a bow tie of some uh, silk, for instance, um, and to the memory uh, there. The most crucial thing for me on this monument however is what is just above these curly horns on this uh, this inscription here uh, winkent cum legibus armor which is a very interesting thing now uh, westminster abbey would tell you that there's been a mistake that's made there. it's supposed to be winkett um winning or conquering uh, but I'm going to suggest to you that actually that's not an error. That is the figure of clear exchange, which he also teaches uh, in the art of English poesy. Uh, he's interchanged, if you're interested, I for his initials, E-N or e double -V. Uh, But forget that. The most important thing is the what it means, which is he wins with the law of arms. That's how I translate that. He wins with... With the law of arms, uh, Winkett is, as it's spelled, is actually the name of a of, of a man, uh, commonly pronounced in today's uh, parlance as Vincent. Um, so it's it's a male name as well. Uh, and above this Winkett uh, cum legibus armor, he wins with the law of arms. We have a coat of arms uh, there, um, some hot demi fleur de lis somewhere there as well. And on the top, uh, we have uh, two very swift greyhounds so both of those uh, are greyhounds which, which are pretty pretty swift uh, not the fastest animal though so the um the monument we've just seen uh is here here's our monument to edward and robert atkins it just so happens uh, along the same wall uh, this is poet's corner uh, if you're not already familiar poet's corner uh, south transept, although that's uh, that's probably the west wall. Um, along the same wall, it just so happens that you have another monument, uh, someone to do with the law of arms, someone very important to do with the law of arms. And that monument, and we'll have a look at it, is William Camden, the Clarence King of Arms, the second highest herald in charge of 
the law of arms in England at one time. Uh, and this particular um, king of arms happens to be quite relevant to Shakespeare uh, because he's the one who issued Shakespeare's coat of arms to his father, John Shakespeare. So he signs his name on the third uh, draft grant in 1599, Mr William Camden. Uh, so quite related to Shakespeare, but he's more related to Shakespeare. And it even tells you uh, that there is a strong association to Shakespeare if we look what is directly above this particular monument. And that would be David Garrick, the famous Shakespearean actor. Uh, I like this photo, I caught the light just right. So if we have a look um, at the top, you can see there's a bust and that bust is to Shakespeare. And on the inscription, we have a Shakespeare rose, which you will see later in this video and understand hopefully a little bit better. Uh, Shakespeare and Garrick, like twin stars shall shine and earth irradiate with a beam divine. So we've got Shakespeare three times above uh, this monument of William Camden. Well, if we go back to what Shakespeare was pointing at, he was pointing at the E. And if we have a look at this monument to William Camden, you may well be able to see uh, an E. Can you see it? It's in the background. You have an E. E. So the monument of Shakespeare is telling you to look at this E. Uh, he's looking at he wins with the law of arms. And here is someone in charge of the law of arms, our, our Clarence Sue King of Arms. And he's pointed to this E. Well, I came across a book all about arms, explaining it. A nice introductory primer, uh, let us say, on the elements of armories by Mr. Uh, Ed, Edmund, Edmund uh, Bolton, um, and it just so happens on the front of this book, we have a quote from Ovid's Metamorphoses. I know this because it tells me in the back of the book, uh, in its table of hard words, um, that the quote on the front uh, is to do with Ovid's Metamorphoses. It's from Ovid's Metamorphoses. Any Shakespeare scholar worth their salt would tell you that Metamorphoses is one of the most influential sources to Shakespeare. Interesting. Well, it just so happens that this book has a dedicated letter from none other than Mr. William Camden. How interesting. Also in our short table of some hard words and phrases with a few brief, oh, was that an E on the end there? Notes. Uh, under the letter E, uh, we have defined for us equivocal. If you didn't know what the word equivocal means, equivocal, um, a, a word equivocal is that which contains more significations than one or that which in the sense or meaning thereof doth equally extend itself as well to one as to another, as the word arms. In one uh, in our vulgar use thereof doth equally signify those parts of our body so called, i.e. arms, all weapons, all tokens of arms, uh, tokens of honour, and with an aspiration, uh, which is an Hellenic uh, Greek, or deceit in the accent, as in harms. So H is a deceit in the accent, because it's harms, arms, it's still arms. Um, notice that uh, arms also refers to those parts of our body. Well, I'm going to uh, suggest to you that the book he is holding, the Britannia, uh, which is also indicated on the inscription on the monument, uh, is not um, just referring to the Britannia. It is equivocal, just as there's an E in the background there. And the book that we're actually also referring to is a book called the Minerva Britanna. Now, the Minerva Britanna happens to have on the front of the book, just as you've seen defined for you, a secret arm. There is a secret arm on the front of the book, as has just been explained to you in a table of hard words. Uh, the last uh, two letters he's writing is or, uh, 
in heraldic terms, the way we describe uh, a co the colour gold is by the French term or. So there it is for you. Now, in the front of this book, we have another, uh, in this case, dedicated poem. And this poem is by William Sagar Garter and another principal king of arms. He is the principal king of arms after William Dethick, who was the principal king of arms alongside William Camden, who issued Shakespeare his coat of arms. So the principal king of arms after has dedicated a letter to this book. He also happens to dedicate a letter to the elements of armories, the same book with a dedicated letter from Mr. William Camden. Coincidence? I think not. Uh, the most important thing about the frontispiece, which I do uh, really, really wish for you to pay attention to, is printed in shoe line at the sign of the Falcon uh, by W.A. Dite. The Falcon, very important, because that is what is on the top of Shakespeare's coat of arms. We have a falcon uh, holding a spear there. And what does a falcon mean in heraldry? Well, it's one who does not rest until the object objective is achieved. So one who does not rest until the objective is achieved. Uh, you'll meet the sign of the falcon because he's going to use this sign of the falcon uh, to communicate something to you shortly. Uh, so, unfortunately, the inscription gives an incorrect age. Oh no, there's another fault on our Westminster Abbey monument. You'd assume a monument of such importance, they'd get such... Um, it wouldn't make such an obvious mistake as in the last line. Now, I'll go over this mistake uh, a little bit later, but I just want you to be aware there's a mistake with Atatus uh, Swai, uh, 74. Uh, that's, uh, he died at the age of 74. He didn't. Uh, so he's holding a book there. Uh, this book, if you remember one thing from this monument, please remember the shape of uh, what is on the front. That is a diamond or a, a rhombus, or as he might call it, a lozenge. So there is your lozenge shape. Please do remember it. So there's our William Camden uh, monument uh, at, uh, in, well, at the limit of this wall here, um, at the end of this wall. Now, allow me please to redefine Poet's Corner for you. You may wish to move the apostrophe. Um, because, well, here's our corner. You've seen this monument here. Actually, a lot of these monuments uh, are very witty. I'll just draw this here so you can kind of get an idea uh, that it is indeed a corner. There's the west, there's the, uh, the south wall. And just as the William Camden Monument was at that end, let's have a look at the other end uh, of this corner uh, at this particular monument, which happens also to be quite meaningful. So if we have a look at this monument, this monument happens to be a monument to O. Rare Ben Johnson by uh, none other than the Earl of Oxford, erected in 1723, um, according to Westminster Abbey. Now, there's a, there's a bit of a problem there, given the fact that the last Earl of Oxford died by that title in 1703. Hmm. Uh, I go into this in a, a short-ish 10-minute video uh, about this discrepancy, uh, which you can watch, but I'm not going to talk about it now. Uh, so it's by the Earl of Oxford. Uh, if you notice the inscription there at the bottom, it says, O Rare Ben Johnson. Um, interestingly, uh, if you look at the first folio, Ben Johnson signs his name uh, with uh, a colon. There's a colon between Ben and Johnson, uh, just as also uh, Edmund Bolton also has a colon uh, in his name there. Interesting. So if we do a little bit more analysis about what's going on here, you may notice uh, from our previous uh, monument opposite Shakespeare, we have our curly, kind of our, our, our curly horns, both at the top there. We have also 
the ties. We've got two ties here tying this this silk, which is seems to be going through these uh, these masks. And at the top of our O'Rare Ben Johnson monument by the Earl of Oxford, uh, we have a lamp. Now note that this lamp is not a lit. So there we go. There's a there's poet's corner for you. Uh, William Camden monument and our other monument by two Ben Johnson. So if we uh, now synthesise our learning and put what we know together, we have O'Rare Ben Johnson, and if we add that to the important thing I asked you to remember, which was our lozenge shape from our William Camden monument, we're going to find exactly where uh, the poet uh, behind Shakespeare is buried. Are you ready? Here we go. There you go. So uh, this is the, the, the grave of Mr. Ben Johnson. You can see the lozenge shape from the William Camden book and the O'Rare Ben Johnson from the uh, dedicated uh, monument by the Earl of Oxford. Put it together and that is what you have. Now there's some interesting things actually about this monument which we're going to have a look at but the first and most interesting thing which you should know if you don't already know is that Ben Johnson is the only person buried in an upright position in Westminster Abbey. He's the only person buried standing up in Westminster Abbey. That's pretty peculiar and also um, quite unique. Just as actually, if you have a look at the, the falcon holding uh, the spear on, on top of Shakespeare's coat of arms, you may notice the spear is upright. And in the elements of armories, it tells you all other our like endeavours as unto their vertical point aspire to seek the glory of God. So pointing up, aspiring to point up to seek the glory of God. And the last thing that is written in the main body of the text before the table of hard words in the elements of armories is this. Thus much for position, the last element of the four, and here by your good favour, I will pitch up one of my columns. And indeed, he has. He's pitched up the most natural column that he possesses, his body. So there we go. The poet, Ben Johnson or whoever that is, is standing upright underneath this stone. Now, as to the O'Rare Ben Johnson, well, the O'Rare actually comes from one of Ben Johnson's uh, plays every man out of his humour. This is a uh, quite a crucial play um, because it's all about someone who possesses a coat of arms that they don't understand. Uh, so it's a very witty, very brilliant uh, play, but that's where O'Rare Ben Johnson comes from. And you'll notice that's the spelling on the uh, monument that we've seen before. But this is the normal spelling that you will come across of Ben Johnson as per the first folio. That is how he spells his name. And you might notice uh, that there's a little discrepancy. Uh, on, this, uh, monu uh, on this gravestone we have an additional H and so on the Earl of Oxford's dedicated uh, monument we have an additional H. Of course, he did all tell you that, didn't he, with the deceit in accents of H. So this is a deceit in accent. Uh, but it's also, if you know the history of H, where it comes from, it comes from the Greek letter eta, um, which in the best and quickest way I could um, do this is if we consider the IHS monogram, the first three letters of Jesus in Greek and Latin, uh, your eta is your E. So your eta is your E. As you can see, this is from the Minerva Britannia, actually, you can see your H and your E in the same thing. It's telling you that your eta is your E. So again, this is our figure of addition. We've added an, an additional letter, our E, because our eta is our E, to let you know that there's some cunning and some conceit uh, afoot. So our deceit in accent and figure of addition are H there, which is why there's that variance in spelling. Now, 
just so happened I was very, very lucky that I managed to capture uh, what was above this monument, uh, this gravestone. And above this gravestone is this. Can you see it? This is a falcon. It is a golden falcon, a falcon in awe. Um, there you can see it a little bit better. Uh, this is our sign of our falcon. And just as with our falcon atop uh, Shakespeare's coat of arms, you have your spear or scepter uh, being held upright. And it's pointing to this uh, grave of Ben Jonson. And below we can see this uh, lovely um, uh, quote from the Psalms. In wisdom hast thou made them all. And in Ben Jonson's uh, dedicated poem in the first folio, he says... For a good poet's maid, as well as born, and such wert thou. And indeed he was. Ben Jonson was made. So, if we have a look back at uh, Mr Shakespeare in Westminster uh, Abbey, then if we... I'm not sure how many people will have, will have done this, but if we actually have a look at his foot and what's underneath, you might notice this. So if you have a look in the back, you can see that something... Something's been uh, made there. That's quite ornate. And, oh, look, there's a familiar shape for us, our lozenge shape. And there's also a mark on his heel. That's probably because if the uh, monument was to do a tour of Westminster Abbey, uh, he would have walked over that grave, probably quite uh, unknowingly, uh, to arrive where he is. And hopefully now this makes a lot more sense as to what is um, on uh, the frontispiece of the Britannia, uh, which is printed in Shoe Lane at the sign of the Falcon by W.A. Dite. Uh, if you're wondering what the W.A. Dite is, you have the double V um, of the W. A, remember, is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. T is the last letter. And what you have between the first letter and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, but die get it so he's telling you that this is where he is buried this is his grave so double v uh, die a and t um it's brilliant no i love a bit of wordplay so uh if we have a look at the um if we have a look at the uh, the first folio at the title page uh hopefully you are familiar uh, with this this is a dedicated poem we start the first thing in there the dedicated poem uh by none other than Mr. Uh, ben Johnson. Now, this was done in uh, 1623. Okay, that's when the first folio uh, was published. We have uh, Mr. Shakespeare here. Now, this isn't um, to the memory. This is to the reader. You may notice the E is italicised there, actually. Um, and it starts with this figure. Now, it is not referring to this figure uh adjacent which is the Drusout portrait of Shakespeare it's not referring to that or it's being equivocal um, it's also referring to this figure uh, here another figure of rhetoric and that figure is uh, the figure of counterfeit representation or counterfeit countenance that is Mr Ben Johnson uh, who is a is a figure himself and uh, I've already shown you and I'm just going to keep showing you this um, that actually this is a load of nonsense. You can tell that, for instance, if you look at his collar, which is page light, look how sharp those corners of that page are. Uh, but also it, it tells you pretty much in the sonnets, if you, um, it, it gives you instructions that if you take multiple copies of the Drusout portrait, align the eyes and shine a light through the back, then you can make hidden images. Uh, such as this. Here's a lamb. You have its nose there, its two eyes, um, its face there. Hopefully you can see that. Sonnet 96. If like a lamb he could, his looks translate. Uh, so the Drusout portrait is very much not uh, what it's cracked up to be. Now if we go and just think about uh, Mr Ben Johnson, uh, this figure, in wisdom hast thou made them all, Ben Johnson, um, well, he's a poet, playwright and actor, but he is not wearing a mask. He is a mask. And if we just read a little bit about uh, 
what apparently what we do know from the Westminster Abbey website uh, little Lil is known about his parents possibly attended St John's College uh, went in trade as a bricklayer no children survived him he became an actor and in 1598, he killed a fellow actor. I find that ridiculous because murder was a capital offence, uh, so he should have been hung, but seemed to escape and was little affected. Um, his play, Every Man in His Humour, included Shakespeare in his cast. Funny that, that every man out of his humour has Shakespeare left out. How interesting. Um Johnson was a well-known writer of masks, but did you notice uh, the most important part of that biography? He was educated at Westminster School at the expense of Master William Camden. Mr William Camden is the person responsible for his education. Uh, ben Johnson goes on to further write an epigram uh, to William Camden saying Camden most reverend head to whom I owe all that I am in arts all that I know how nothing's that just notice the capital letters in that please uh, all that I am in arts uh, so he, he's pretty much telling you um, that he's he's nothing um, notice also that the William Camden monument uh, he he died in 1623 that's the same date of publication as the first folio. It's a, it's a perfect date um, if you think about six um, and its factors and what a perfect number is. Um, it's this very much the sum um, of its parts. So, uh, as to the error on the William Camden monument, unfortunately the inscription gives an incorrect age. Atatus Suai 74, apart from William Camden's life dates, are there. Uh, the 2nd of May 1551 to the 9th of November 1623, which would make that Atata Swai 72. So actually, we're out by two years, and I've put that in Roman numerals uh, below. So we're out by two years. And if we look at the Minerva Britannia, uh, Britannia we can see, well, you have two eyes. Interesting. There's your two. And it just so happens that O'Rare Ben Johnson, our gravestone, there happens to be two of them. Ah. So there's two of them, two stones of, of O'Rare Ben Johnson. And if we look where they are, now this, um, <laughs> this grave is in incredibly inconspicuous. It's so easy to miss. I know where it is. And sometimes I'm still struggling to find it because of it's it's nicely camouflaged amongst uh, the other lozenge-shaped uh, stones. There, it's, it's, it's rather brilliant. Um, so it is there. There is your gravestone to O'Reilly Ben Johnson. Your second uh, stone is here. It's behind these helpfully placed chairs right there. Uh, O'Reilly Ben Johnson. So we have two stones to O'Reilly Ben Johnson. Now. It just so happens that these stones are at a right angle. They are at 90 degrees, just as Poet's Corner. A corner is at 90 degrees, a right angle. Um, the spear that's being held up, well, being held up is at 90 degrees to the ground. That's to hold something up. Um, we have... Uh, whoever's buried under there, upright at 90 degrees. And if you think about what a, uh, a square or a lozenge are, it actually has, um, well, four right angles in it. Um, and of course, we've seen our falcon that's directly pointing uh, to it on the grave of John Hunter. Certainly is hunting for something. Uh, we have this sign of the falcon uh, with our scepter held upright. Uh, now, I did also tell you to remember the lamp. Well, if we have a look on the same wall as where the second uh, Ben Johnson stone is, you'll notice that there's a lamp and this lamp happens to be a flame. Uh, so there is our burning lamp. Now, 1623, 
uh, saw the publication of Shakespeare's first folio, as we've said, a crucial moment in the history of book and in the establishment of categories like authorship, print and literature. It also happens to be a very uh, tragic year for Mr Ben Johnson for his library burnt down. A fire destroyed some or much or all we don't exactly know of Ben Johnson's library. Uh, this is taken from the wonderful uh, article Burning to Read uh, Ben Johnson's Library Fire of 1623 by Professor Adam Smith from the University of Oxford, which I very much enjoyed. Um, particular things uh, where, uh, under libraries of the mind, for instance, where he questions, but do Johnson's books need to exist? Do they? Uh, he also makes reference to a contemporary of Ben Johnson's at the time, George Chapman, who also casts aspersions and doubt onto the legitimacy of Mr Ben Johnson's library. Um, so, hmm, did it exist? But either way, Mr Ben Johnson laments the loss of his library in a poem. Uh, and this uh, is takes place in Ben Johnson's exe execration against, or sometimes upon, Vulcan, uh, where he laments this loss. Uh, if we just have a look at this uh, book, this is just wonderful because there's so much uh, wit and cleverness that's taking place here. Now, the first thing you might notice is Ben Johnson. Again, we have uh, our colon, uh, but look at the name of Johnson here and and uh, with our normal spelling. Can you see the eater? One uh, is the normal spelling of Johnson. The other has the figure of addition there that deceit and accent, the H. So on the same page, we also have uh, our two there, our two referring to our two Ben Johnson uh, uh, gravestones and also the two of which we were out by on the William Camden Monument. Vera, two Vs there, again two Vs with diverse ver epigrams by the same author to several noble personages. The same author to several noble personages in this kingdom. Uh, never published before. Uh, John Benson. Can you see how he's just switched the Ben and the John there? John Benson. Uh, and uh, St Dunstan's Churchyard. Now, I missed this the first time <laughs> sillily. Um, I don't know how I managed to. So St Dunstan's Churchyard, if we know a little bit about its history, um, a small Benedictine uh, monastery founded under the patronage of King Edgar and St Dunstan around 1960 AD. Uh, this monastery, King Edward choose to, chose to re-endow and greatly enlarge, building a large stone church in the honour of St Peter the Apostle. This church became known as the West Minster. That's from the Westminster Abbey website again. Okay, so Saint Dunstan's Churchyard is is another name for Westminster Abbey because well, it, some of its remains still remain under uh, Westminster Abbey. So Saint Dunstan's Churchyard is another name for Westminster Abbey. And if we have a look at the books that Mr. Ben Johnson has, you may notice that the ones in the right corner are at a right angle. Hopefully you can see that the books in the right corner are at, the right, at a right angle. And if we have a look at this fleur-de-lis on the front, well, we also have a fleur-de-lis pointing to the grave of Ben Johnson. Within uh, the execration against Vulcan, uh, we have this lovely poem, Ode uh, Pindaric, uh, on the death of Sir Hen, not Sir Ben, Sir Hen uh, Morrison. Um, and it's it's pretty obvious, really. He leaped he, uh, the present age, possessed with holy rage, to see the bright eternal day of which we priests and poets say such truths as we expect for happy men. And there he lives with memory, with memory, and Ben the Stand Johnson. I'm not sure how more obvious this can get, but Ben the Stand Johnson, who sung this of him ere he went himself to rest, or 
gold, remember? Uh, tastes the part of that full joy he meant to have expressed. So there we go, Ben the Stand Johnson. If we also have a look at the epistle dedicatory in the uh, beginning of this book, we have a really, really um, <laughs> exciting proof that I, I really love. Uh, so to the right, honourable. You're going to notice honour a few times here. Honour in the person of one deceased, the form, or for me, whereof somewhat dispersed, yet carry with them the prerogative of truth to be Mr. Ben Johnson's, and will so appear to all whose eyes and spirits are rightly, say that again, rightly placed. You are my Lord. Well, can you see how my Lord's in brackets there? So let's have a look for my Lord. Oh, look. There's my Lord, my Lord T. And underneath we have a mark with an, F, an E, a uh, conceited E, mark of his dessert. T comes from a history, uh, of, like, um, meaning uh, mark. Um, and that's where it comes from. T comes from the Hebrew tav, meaning mark. Um, and if we go to the next bit, by your honour's permission, I shall be glad by this small testimony account. Uh, a testimony accounted a fit opportunity to assure your honour, my Lord, that I am. So what is he saying here? What's this small testimony? He's saying, my Lord, that I am, my Lord, T, my Lord, that I am, I am T. He's telling you that I am T, your most humble and affectionate servant, John Benson. Well, it just so happens we've had a look at a very humble grave and a lamp that is on fire. Well, above that, we happen to have two angels. And what is this angel pointing to but a T? The angel is pointing to a T. My Lord, that I am T. Uh, what what I think is lovely is if you actually consider what a T is, well, a T, the, the most basic rudiments of what a T is, is two lines that are orthogonal, perpendicular, at a right angle. Two lines that are uh, at a right angle. Similarly, an L possesses some of those properties. Uh, so um, if we continue... Uh, if you have a look at what's at the feet of those angels, we have this. This monument was erected at the public expense as an honourable testimony to the to their uh, meritorious services. Honourable. Do you remember? Honours by this small testimony. Actually, we had the right honourable T. Did you spot it? Honour, honour, honour. You've got honour five times in that letter. So it really is an honourable testimony saying that he is T. Um, now, uh, there's another book that I'll speak of a little bit later called The Accedents, which is arguably one of, well, probably the most important book other than The Elements uh, in regards to this. Uh, luckily, I can read. So it told me here and here in this escutcheon is to be noted. So I knew I had to pay attention to whatever this was going to tell me. Um, for example, the glasser uh, that glassed the temple church windows on the north side hath set the arms of England so out of order. Well, Mr. Ben Johnson happens to be buried in the Isle of Scientists. How interesting. Uh, the Isle of Scientists happens to be the Northern Isle, and these windows happen to be the Northern Windows. Uh, there was also a lovely one of one of my um, favourite poems in the Execration of Vulcan um, was uh, a parallel of the prince to the king. His Nestor knew Nestor, of course, known for his wisdom. So Nestor probably does know. In arms his fellow was, but not in years, too soon run out his glass. Ours, though not Nestor knew, we try, uh, uh, trust shall be as wise in arms, as old in years as he. And he certainly is getting quite old in years, and he's certainly very wise in arms. Um, 
So if we have a look at these windows and the two most important windows for me are the ones that are either side of this monument. It's often not what we're directly looking at, but what is also near adjacent to um, or around what we're looking at. Uh, so if we have a look at these two windows here, this one I love, um, the church upon a tomb here, take you a rule that nothing may be set with the head downwards. Well, this person's head is set downward. And you'll also notice there's quite a few arms, um, a lot of which are referenced actually within the Britanna, um, uh, on this marble uh, fronting piece. And you can start to see on the windows themselves. So if we just have a look at this lovely window, uh, you will see that there are two Vs above, two Vs below. Uh, this is the window of Edwardus uh, Primus. We have some E's with a crown, some golden E's with a crown there. Uh, we have a spear that's upright, what looks to me to be an anagram of Via. Uh, and also our crucial uh, curly horns. These curly horns, which you've seen on the monument opposite Shakespeare. Now, what are these curly horns? Now, this refers uh, actually to one of the penultimate stories in Ovid's Metamorphoses in chapter 15. And this is the story of Kippus, a Roman general who grew horns on his head. And there was a prophecy saying that he would be emperor of Rome if he grew these horns on his head. He decides that he doesn't want to be emperor of Rome, so disguises uh, his horns in laurels, um, gets the Senate to pass some legislation, so he's banished from this uh, city. And Rome are so um, proud with this man's uh, humility and graciousness that they reward him by carving ox horns onto the gates of the city. Much like in the uh, the first folio, you'll start seeing these curly ox horns as on the uh, Ancora Spy printing device, which is on the first ever publication of Venus and Adonis and on many other very uh, critical and important publications. We have our ox horns both there and at the top. Uh, on a book that I'll talk about shortly, The Ascendants of Armoury, you have those ox horns, those Kippus ox horns, and on uh, this lovely book, which has some key proofs, Carnana's Comfort, a book uh, apparently uh, by an Italian polymath and friend of Leonardo da Vinci. You also notice uh, we have two characters with ox horns there. So, um, I annoyingly missed, I had to go back to Westminster Abbey twice in one day because I've missed uh, what was hiding uh, behind this marble uh, fronting. Uh, and if we actually walk past the monument and then look back, uh, you will see this rather beautiful uh, thing. This is a golden rose. And hopefully now the Garrick monument makes a little bit more sense. A Shakespeare rose. There is our rose. Shakespeare and Garrick like twin stars shall shine and earth irradiate with a beam divine. Well, glass certainly looks a lot better, i.e. you can see it when you have some light shining through it. Uh, so this is what the Garrick monument is referring to this beautiful uh, golden rose that's hiding behind. And Ben Jonson actually ends his second dedicated poem within the first folio with the following. Shine forth, thou star of poets, and with rage, or, remember, or is gold, influence, chide, or, cheer the drooping, lovely. You have your or there and your or there, if you think your p. In Greek is your arch, your row, so you have an oar, an oar drooping stage, which since thy flight from or hence hath mourned or uh, like night and despairs day, but for thy volumes light. Ben Johnson. So there you go, he's pretty much uh, directing and telling you about this wonderful living monument. Uh, this is the other window. Perhaps my favourite window, just because I think it's really witty. Um, but do you see, if you just, just take a second to have a look at this window, do you see the importance, what's uh, 
uh, what's there can you see it there you go you have your golden falcon uh, your golden falcon and also some falcons with some uh, lace in their mouth uh, there's actually loads going on there but along the window uh, you also have some golden falcons and your ease likewise with your crown uh, we've come across quite a few falcons already remember at the sign of the falcon well what is this particular golden falcon perched aloft looking down upon well he's looking down upon the window of edward the confessor bravo um, i love this window for many reasons um, and if we have a look at what's on the window well you again you have your kippus uh, ox horns there your lovely kippus horns a sign uh, of his uh, thou art a monument without a tomb and art alive still while thy book doth live and we have wits to read and praise to give and i love uh, this window with a passion i certainly have some praise to give now there was a there was something that um struck me as a little bit curious that I, I was struggling to work out which is why is Handel's foot overhanging now we know the monument we've got our Edward and Robert Atkins monument here opposite Shakespeare uh, Handel's foot is above it and overhanging and we know Shakespeare's uh, foot uh, had some uh, meaning in it uh, there's a there's a better photo for you so you can just see his foot overhanging there um, now I spent some time thinking, what, what's, what's going on with it? Here's a, uh, I think, a, a, a much better uh, picture than I can take to show you what is actually going on in this monument. Um, and it seems to be that he's, uh, he's, he's pointing at something. Um, but he's also got this, this scroll of music sheets in his hand. And if we have a look at that, I know that my Redeemer liveth and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth he shall stand so it's telling you on the music himself that uh, uh, someone shall stand uh, and that person certainly does so all of the monuments around have uh, some knowing uh, craftiness and wit in them but um he's also um well you might notice there's a there's a trumpet there and just as the angel was pointing to something, there was also a trumpet that the angel uh, is holding. And she was pointing to a T. But what is, um, what's he, what's he pointing to? So what is Handel pointing to with his hand? What's he pointing to? Well, I spent some time kind of looking around. This monument's important. Um, but like, I spent some time looking around, looking at windows, looking at octagonal clocks kind of um oh, I think, well, what, what's he actually pointing to um well it turns out that these there's shakespeare's monument there for you by the way just so you can get your bearings um these two monuments uh, felt a little bit um out of place a little bit incongruous um, these are wall paintings frescoes um they, they they feel a bit weird. They were found in the twentieth century, um, but yeah, they just they just feel slightly out of place. But if you have a look at them, um, and behind that line of chairs there, you will um, find this. Um, there apparently were two monuments that were placed in front of these uh, wall frescoes. Uh, the monument of John Gay, which had been moved to the east. Uh, triforium and the monument of Nicholas Rao um, that had been moved to the east uh, triforium uh, those wall paintings by the way were um, uh, Doubting Thomas and St Christopher doubt's a good thing uh, so what is Handel pointing to well I think you may uh, know this well he's pointing upwards and he's pointing to the east triforium which you access through this door here beneath uh oxford earl of oxford monument to the queen's diamond gallery so if we go through this door uh, this is a picture from the east Trans triforium so you can see that a handle is actually pointing to you um well if we have a look uh at 
this this gallery we find our two monuments we find our monument uh, to Nicholas Rao uh, which if you have a look at the inscription has a reference to Shakespeare on so we know that they're insinuating something to do with Shakespeare already um, and actually if we have a look what her feet uh, are on um, then look what do we have on this book but our lozenge shape and we have five of these lozenge shapes that's five in roman numerals we have five lozenge shapes if we have a look at uh, one of my favorite monuments the uh, john gay monument well if we have a look at the top of it uh, we have this we have our trumpet uh, we have our masks and we have uh, something tied by actually what looks like now to be uh, two shells. Uh, this is why I like to do it without a script because I always find something else when I'm looking at these things by two shells that then makes five shells, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, so it's tied uh, here. We have our mask. We have our trumpet. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to say... Uh, this which probably won't make any sense but I, I imagine he would probably prefer would have liked me to have said this which is Christ by his trumpet raise me hence uh, and I'm not going to qualify that as of yet uh, so there we go there's a trumpet and uh, above that uh, we have uh, this which I'm sure you can see is our kippus this is a character with horns kippus horns on his head just as you've seen on the monument opposite Shakespeare uh, on the windows um, and on well all over the place it's a sign that the work is by him uh, if we have a more detailed look at our kippus then you'll notice that actually um, within this uh, cartouche this scroll we have some arms uh, and we have one two three four five silver or argent lozenges um, so the same shape as underneath her foot and again that's uh, five lozenges uh, I know these are lozenges because it tells me uh, thank you to Westminster Abbey for including the blazon of description of arms um, and we also have uh, our scallops our shells um, which uh, is what is if I go back uh, is what's holding up uh, tying all these things together these uh, five now because if you include the ones on the arms themselves these five shells uh, and what is underneath his feet I will choose to end my video with in a little bit uh, so it just so turns out that in the um, in the Queen's Diamond Jubilee gal uh, gallery um, in the Triforium uh, there's also hidden away you will have to ask them to open a drawer uh, for this is a lovely book uh, by none other than William Camden. Uh, this is the earliest guidebook to the tombs and monuments in Westminster Abbey. Um, I would love to have a read of this book. I really would do. Um, so this is the kings, queens, nobles and others buried in the collegiate church of Blessed Peter at Westminster and uh, it's a I can tell you already, it's a really uh, beautiful um, book with lots of meaning. So I'd love to have a read of this book uh, in future, perhaps. So um, what do we know? You know where this incredibly humble grave is that you likely uh, will walk over. So please, when you visit, perhaps you may uh, wish uh, just to uh, make sure you you pay attention to it as you go over it. Uh, so here is our wonderful grave uh, of O'Rare Ben Johnson and with our poet who is buried beneath at the sign of the falcon. Uh, hopefully you understand Poet's Corner. Uh, this is a corner that belongs to a poet. Um, hopefully you understand this slightly more. There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of wit uh, going around, but please do pay attention to these two monuments in particular when you go and also uh, this wonderful uh, monument here, uh, which is uh, opposite Shakespeare. It's the one he's looking at. Um, 
and also certainly pay attention to the detail in this monument. There's a lot of detail uh, in this monument. Uh, be sure, this is a, another poem from um, a dedicated poem in the first folio, be sure our Shakespeare, you may notice that that hyphen is an equal sign, it's a double hyphen. The reason for that is who is shaking the spear in his coat of arms, it is the falcon. This falcon is a sign and a symbol that helps solve this debate. In the art of English poesy he calls it the speedy dispatcher because it's a way to win an argument. And if you think the falcon is the fastest animal uh, on, on Earth today, the peregrine falcon is still the fastest animal. Uh, it's pretty swift, swifter than those greyhounds on top. Uh, so thou canst never die, but crowned with law. See it? It's beautiful. And that, of course, is referring to our William Cadden monument there, crowned with law, uh, crowned with laurel, live eternally. And I hope this poet is going to get the recognition he rightly deserves because he has done more than perhaps uh, anyone for our English tongue and for learning uh, and our country. Uh, so uh, the elements of armories, <laughs> well, <laughs> Basically, if you can read, and you can read for more than just a single meaning, um, just follow the instructions within it. That's all I've been doing. Uh, so, uh, Gerard Lee hath done very commendably well. Uh, his discourse or book being of arms born and how they were to be blazed. So, this book uh, that I've just been directed to by Gerard Lee is all about arms and how they are to be blazed. The blazon is the description of arms, and it's all to do with blazon uh, and the law of arms this is this book uh, you have gerard here this character and lee here gerard is a a, a, herehort, a herald um someone wise in the law of arms and here's a a knight uh, lee oh isn't that interesting the author of the book is named after the characters or are the characters named after after the author or vice versa who knows uh, this is a really uh, pivotal book for solving the Shakespeare authorship debate and leading us on uh, to greater debates. Uh, so uh, we have here uh, the Minerva Britanna, which we've spoken about already, which now you know has a secret arm on the front and is all to do with coats of arms. Once you realise that, it's actually a really fun read um, because uh, it's all <laughs> it's all to do with coats of arms, but in witty and clever um, ways. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so if we just have a quick look at the front of it, just so you can apply some of the things you've learned already and, and see the commonalities for yourself. We have our Kippus Oxhorns. We have our tie there. We have our fire at the top. Uh, you also um, have your two lions above your uh, the monument of Edward and Robert uh, Atkins, opposite Shakespeare, you have two lions. You also have two lions in the corners there. You have a king and you have a uh, a lawyer. Uh, so we have very much a king of arms here. And on this wonderful shield, probably my favourite shield in the world, uh, you have uh, virtue. So these are uh, different representations of prudence, justice, fortitude and temperance blazed uh, across uh, this shield. So virtue is quite important. And a key proof in the corner. Now we, um, now I uh, go through this in two um, uh, videos. This one which was eight hours of me just kind of rabbiting on uh, and also contains the secret of secrets. Uh, spoiler who his parents are. That probably comes around about five hours in. Uh, I completely did not intend to find that when I started reading that book, um, nor did I want to get involved in that debate, but it just so happened that it just fell out. Uh, and in this um, in this uh, uh, video, it's a shorter, more condensed uh, version, but misses some of the key proofs and a lot of the wit, but you have a more condensed version. Uh, so if we go back uh, here, there's loads of things going on, loads of signs and um, tokens that's uh, going on here. Uh, but I'm just going to go through one uh, proof. Proof by Corners Lurked before. Uh, so this is in To the Reader. This is how he ends the To the Reader. You can always tell whether a book is by uh, this author 
by reading the to the reader. It's a typical uh, giveaway. Uh, so described here, if hereby your minds be stirred by virtue to seek what erst you lacked, then are ye also indebted to this well-deserving author, but of necessity enforced ye of elder fame, that's us, embrace the man and love the work. Notice the E on the end of work there. And here your virtues are displayed and blazed to the world that but in corners lurked before. And if we have a look, because this is before this frontispiece, at what is lurking in the corner. Well, let's look at what people are either pointing to or looking at. So pointing to, looking at, looking at. And we have in our corner our two Vs, our double V, our do veer. Uh, our de vir, our two Vs. And here's a uh, Mrs. in Cardinal's Conference. There's a letter from the Earl of Oxford. Uh, and we have our double V and our virtue. Uh, we have a double V in our first folio. Notice it overlaps the principal actor in his play as well. Uh, we have two Vs with a hair. Hairs are known for being pretty swift um, in the elements of armory. Uh, in the front, the dedication, you've got quite a few uh, double Vs and virtue. I like this virtue because it has two uh, double Vs uh, within the virtue itself. Uh, and also just clock the honour. We've got some honour and some humbleness as well. Uh, and you've already met some double Vs in the case of uh, W.A. Dite and Vulcan. You've been seeing WV uh, Vs all the way through uh, this video. Well, it just so happens... Um, as I said, that what people look at is also really important. So it's not just what people are pointing to, but what they're looking at. So I suddenly realised after I'd taken this uh, photo that what um, uh, Cupid was looking at is important. Now, we've already had two Vs anyway uh, within the lozenges. We've had our, well, our devere of these, these lozenges. So we've already had that. But if we have a look at what Oh, yeah. Forgot to say. Sorry. Forgive me. Um, so uh, in the corner of this monument, in the corner of this monument on the wall behind, uh, you have this beautiful thing, which I'm not going to talk too much about in this video. But if you think uh, what uh, uh, letter D is of the alphabet, it is the fourth letter of the alphabet. Uh, oh, is that a 40? Is that a J D? Maybe. I wonder who that could represent. Uh, but if you have a look at what Cupid is looking to, well, he, from this photo, he seems to be looking down to the corner. So I thought, oh, could there be, for instance, two Vs also in the corner of that monument? Um, but I wanted to double check and be sure. Uh, unfortunately, um, I um, am self-isolating at the moment. So I asked uh, my good friend uh, John and his friend, who are both sceptical English teachers to go along and have a look at what uh, our little uh, love god uh, is looking at. Uh, so they very kindly went along uh, to uh, find for me the double V's of what he was looking at. And it just so happens that there they are. Uh, so if we look at where uh, he is looking at, uh, thank you very much to my kind uh, volunteer who's doing this. Um, so if you have a look at where he's looking at, uh, he's looking at two Vs in the stonework. And both of the sceptical English teachers uh, were convinced that there were double Vs, that they were not there by accident. So there are your double Vs that our uh, little love gods, our cupids, uh, our cherubim of um, uh, the John Gay monument is looking at. So there we go. Best for comedy. <laughs> Edward de Vere. That's what the de Veres are referring to. They're referring to this uh, incomparably, uh, incomparable prince uh, who has done so much for learning and for our country than anyone could possibly uh, imagine. Uh, so you'll notice this is his Titian portrait and in the background you have a man uh, in a mask. There's the mask, there is his arm uh, and you've seen quite a few masks already. Uh, he certainly did take to the stage. Um, and here's something from the uh, Minerva Britanna, uh, 
all shapes like Proteus, a shape-shifting god, uh, gladly entertains. Thus, every way transform himself he can. Uh, so, I have very interesting authorship views. Um, so, other, uh, um, other than believing that Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, uh, wrote the works of Shakespeare, I also believe he, were, he wrote many other great works. Just as Shakespeare is a mask, uh, there are a few more masks. And, um, well, let's start with these, shall we? Um, I'm going to break you in gradually uh, to this. Uh, so Johnson, we've already seen. Um, I'm convinced these people already and many others, but let's just go for these. Johnson, Marlowe, Bacon, Florio, North, Montagnier, Sidney, Harrington, Chapman. Come on, the first translation. So you really think he's not going to translate um, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey? Of course he's going to. Um, if you've also been doing work with the King James Bible, I very much agree with you. Uh, by the way, the 1611 King James Version, um, version I very much agree with that as well. Uh, so these, these are the people that I believe. So if you are an authorship uh, sceptic, um, uh, if, if you believe uh, that one of those people uh, wrote the works of Shakespeare, I very much agree with you. Uh, we are in agreement. Um, and I just think there's a little bit more to it that actually you have one of the most uh, brilliant men of his ages, uh, of his age, a true uh, polymath and perhaps the most literate man. Uh, I, I, in my estimation, I put him above Leonardo da Vinci, uh, which kind of gives you an idea of some of the things uh, he's done. Uh, and we've seen uh, that he is uh, Johnson, that Johnson is a mask. I've given you quite a lot of evidence in this video that he is uh, both Johnson and Shakespeare. So if you are willing to accept that Shakespeare is written by someone else, it is not a stretch too far uh, to assume that this uh, wonderful uh, poet may have also created a few other masks and I truly believe he is. He's buried in the Isle of Scientists for a reason and I should probably say if we really want to win this debate then united we stand. It's really important uh, we all kind of come together and hopefully explore some of these ideas uh, a little bit more uh, and just to, uh, to go through this and show you the bit before that was on uh, written on the scroll, you do look, my son, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir. Our revels now are ended. These are actors. As I foretold you, we're all spirits and are melted into the air, into the thin air. So if you've ever been to Westminster Abbey um, and have done the tour, you've already likely walked over at the grave of this princely genius um in this uh, he's the ship you're the person standing um so the passenger may be warned uh, uh, may warned be to say they had their being here another day and indeed you have uh, so i'll end with what our little love god has got his feet on which is this um which is life is a jest and all things show it I thought so once, but now I know it. Um, thank you very much uh, for watching um, and uh, peace to you.